Usually when you want to visit a country that you've never been to before, you might have to fill out what they call a visa application. For those of you who have been out of the country, you know what I'm talking about. Some visa applications are less complicated than others, but those that are complicated are real complicated. And what do they ask you? They ask you, have you ever been convicted of a crime or a felony? So you have to answer yes or no. If you answer yes, you need to go ahead and explain things and that might destroy your chances of getting a visa. If you want to live in a place like I'm living right now, you need to get a Interpol scan or screen to get a work permit. Those are the things that most times you have to do to stay in a place. However, when the migrant crisis is occurring, that's not what the migrants have to do. They can literally just come into the United States and we don't know very much about them. But more on that later. Let's go all the way to New York City, which is one of the places being affected heavily by the migrant crisis. We now we have squatters with dangerous weapons living across the street from an elementary school. And I'll let you listen to this clip. Talk about um, several of the six migrant squatters released without bail on gun and drug charges. They are now back behind bars. Three were taken into custody by ICE agents in the Norwood section of the Bronx yesterday. That was a surprise. Authorities say they were part of a heavily armed group of migrants allegedly selling drugs after taking over this multi-family house. They were squatting there despite the landlord trying to get yes, them out. Yes, I got you. Eight were arrested last week. The DA's office was asking for bail, but six were set free on supervised release by a judge while the other two were being held due to prior arrests. But some of those six, they also had prior arrests. Earlier this week, I sat down with the NYPD Chief of Patrol, John Shell, to discuss this situation. A uh, sergeant and two cops pull up to this house. They see a man pointing a gun down a driveway. They chase that man into a into a uh, basement apartment and they make make the arrest. Uh, that man was out on an attempted murder from Yonkers months prior. That's right. This particular gang in Venezuela is even stronger than the Mexican cartel, and they're tied in with presidents. And this cartel doesn't really deal with drugs or guns. It deals with human trafficking. But this next part is going to be astonishing when she says this. Hold on, when they say this. Um, three quick things about the Tren de Aragua. The first, and I've said this many times, but it's merit saying it again, it is the fastest growing transnational criminal organization, is that the specialization of the Tren de Aragua from Venezuela is not drug trafficking, it's not money laundering, it's human smuggling and human trafficking. That's what they're experts. Yeah, it's fascinating. The state of, of Venezuela, or the, the, the socialist communist state of Venezuela, working with these gangs. And then we had Congressman Nels on our show. Um, I had him on my podcast as well. And he said well, that he was getting information that our government knew that Venezuela was releasing these these um, these prisoners from these gang uh, from these uh, prisons. So why why wouldn't we have known? I mean, obviously, we knew that. How are we allowing them to come through the southern border? What is our government doing? What are you hearing about how we're trying to protect ourselves? Is anything being done? Well, that, that's a great question, Alicia, because I think we were fundamentally underprepared for this, and we shouldn't have been, because if you were just right. paying attention to Latin America, you were talking to our South American partners in Peru and Chile and Colombia or anywhere, really, they would have told us this is going to be your big problem. In fact, I've said it. Uh, many several years ago. So we shouldn't have been underprepared. We were underprepared. But I think the ways to remedy this today is one, I think there's been certain Senator, I think Senator Rubio, I think Congresswoman uh, um, Maria Villasada have mentioned labeling them as a transnational criminal organization. That's the first step. That's absolutely necessary because it provides more authorities to law enforcement to go after them in a much broader way. And according to That's right. This particular gang, the United States knew that Venezuela, get this, would be releasing some of the worst parts of their criminal base into the country. Now, a lady from Chicago predicted this at one of the city council meetings. I'm gonna play that right now. Everybody knows about a movie, Scarface, right? It's a classic, Al Pacino, right? Everybody knows about that movie. And we 
you know, we focus on the famous lines in that movie. You know, the acting and the hello to my little friend and all that. But it's the beginning of that movie that matters. When those words are coming up on that screen, that's what matters. And those words say, in May 1980, Fidel Castro opened the harbor at Muriel, Cuba, with the apparent intention of letting some of his people join their relatives in the United States. Within 72 hours, 3,000 U.S. boats were headed for Cuba. It soon became evident that Castro was forcing the boat owners to carry back with them not only their relatives, but the dregs of his jails. Of that 125,000 refugees that landed in Florida, an estimated 25,000 had criminal records. That's what's up. That's what has happened in the United States. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of these people got out on bail without charges. Yes, that's what's happening. So they're committing these crimes, doing these things, and they're getting back out on the street. All right. It's been happening in New York City and sometimes Chicago. That's why you have many different people committing the same type of atrocities against American citizens, even women, and they're getting back out. It's crazy, right? But wait a minute. There is more. Let's talk about the gentleman that lived next door to these guys. How does he feel? According to a complaint filed in court, a search at the home turned up even more guns, ammunition, and cocaine. There were nuisance in the neighborhood. The eight suspects face gun, drug, and child endangerment charges. All but two of them were released without bail, something that has neighbors sleeping with one eye open. Obviously, you don't want hooligans hanging out with you or living near you. you know? It's a very peaceful, quiet street. That's right. They're probably going to get out and go back to the same residence that they were in, and it terrorizes the people that are from that particular community. What are they supposed to do? Right. And it makes people more emboldened. And that's the scary thing. You have these criminals who shouldn't be there. You can't fingerprint them. Venezuela is not sharing their particular um, information, criminal history or nothing. They're just coming into the country and then they're doing things like they're going to attack the police. They're going to you know, use up resources. And guess who's paying for that? people that live in new york city that work every day are paying for criminals to somehow find a way to commit more crime for their particular gang that they want to be now we understand this is not all venezuelans but we just got to understand how sad that is right just to think about like for those of you who work very hard and you live in new york city new york city is not cheap it is not cheap on one hand you have migrants getting into shelters better than the shelters that you have. That happened, because Tiffany Fulton talked about that. You literally have people that are migrants that are living better than people in the city of New York. Then you have a mayor who's giving out $54 million in prepaid credit cards to these same migrants. He would also like to give them work permits. And then whenever they commit a crime, gunshots! Or get caught with something, they are being let out of prison or out of jail only to go back and do the same thing again. And we all know if it was a black person, American citizen, you would never let that happen. You would put them underneath the jail. But for this situation, y'all don't have no kind of sympathy on anybody in the community. You don't have any sympathy for anybody in New York. And again, this is why you having crazy things in New York. You know, right now there are guys in New York doing stuff like this. Multiple women in New York City taking to social media claiming they've been randomly punched on the street. Yeah, the videos are surprising and they've sparked nationwide outrage. Fox Eyes' Michelle Ross takes a closer look at what's been happening. You guys, I was literally just walking and a man came up and punched me in the face. So I just got punched in the face walking home. Women are taking to TikTok sharing similar stories of them getting punched in the face in unprovoked attacks on the streets of New York City. Oh my God, it hurts so bad. I can't even talk. 
Influencer Hallie Kate developed a bump on her forehead after she says a man walking a dog punched her on Monday in Chelsea. For that attack, police charged 40-year-old Skabuki Stora with assault and harassment. Standing in front of a Trump flag, he claims he's a great-great-grandson of Marcus Garvey. With more than 90,000 followers on social media, he posts videos of women and his interactions with police. Hey, you finally harassing a white person, man. Good job, man. It's unclear if he's responsible for the other attacks. The string of women said this happened to them in recent weeks. This woman posted about getting punched in the face two years ago. Oh my actual God, I literally just got punched in the face by a homeless man. Like literally walking to the gym. I fall straight to the ground and I'm just in like absolute disbelief. Literally as soon as they came, they were like, do you want to get in the back of the car and go try to find this guy? They like threw on their sirens. We ran around all of Soho. In a now deleted comment on one of the TikTok videos, former Real Housewives of New York City star Bethany Frankel commented with a similar experience, writing, This happened to me a few months ago, but I was embarrassed to say. I was taking a video of a bakery. And in almost all of the TikTok videos, the women say that they were on their phones not paying attention. So they are telling women everywhere to be more aware of their surroundings. In Chelsea, Michelle Ross, Fox 5 News. That's right. Women are being punched in the face randomly in New York. Right now, I said to say this that's because people feel so emboldened to take advantage of the system because things are not working there. That's why Stephen A. Smith said, Hey, he's tired of New York City, doesn't want to be there. If it wasn't for his sister, he wouldn't be there. You have a silly ass mayor there, and then you have this you have a whole bunch of people committing crimes, you have some of the worst parts of this particular group infiltrating New York City. And we're not to say all of them are terrible because we don't have the truth. But we do know that people are coming over without being examined for their past criminal history in life. And they're just slipping in through the cracks. So what do you think they're gonna do when they get there? They're gonna be more criminal minded, all right? And so you can thank Joe Biden for this. And anybody who ever voted Democrat, just know, you have voted for this because let me tell you this, Joe Biden was a very clear on what he wanted to do for immigrants. If you don't believe me, let's check out that clip. Your first 100 days as president, what will you do to create a pathway to citizenship for many undocumented immigrants? That is a big issue for the AAPI community. As you know, 1.7 million face deportation threats. Another 100,000 are young people who are affected by the, the DACA program. So two parts for you. What are you gonna do to be more visible? And what do you say to the folks that think you're just going to be President Obama 2.0? And what are you gonna do about immigration right when you get in office? On day one, I'm gonna send a legislative immigration reform bill to Congress to provide a roadmap to citizenship for 11 million undocumented immigrants who contribute so much to this country, including 1.7 million 1.7 million AAPI. My immigration policy is built around keeping families together, modernizing the immigration system by keeping families unification and diversity as pillars of our immigration system, which it used to be. Ending Trump's cruel and humane policy at the border to rip children from their mother's arms. Take immediate action to protect dreamers, including the more than 100,000 eligible dreamers from East and South Asia rescinding the un-American Muslim ban immediately, restoring refugee admission in line with the values and historic leadership of our country, raising the target to a minimum of 125,000 people. That's right. Joe Biden wants to help the immigrants come over. It doesn't matter if they have a criminal record or not. Plain and simple. We're in a lot of trouble, guys. Guys, what do you think? It's your boy, Shady Jackson, back at it again. Another episode of Fair Use. I'm out.